this RAM session is uh, shared by uh, Brice Mino and myself. We're very happy to have you here. So before we start uh, the contributed talks, uh, there are a few announcements that we'd like to make. Um, so I think you're all more or less used to this, how it works in a RAM session. We have short talks, and uh, it's nice if uh, everything goes smoothly from one speaker to another. So to do that before every presentation, there will be a small slide that says, well, what is the presentation that's about to start, and what's the next one? You have to look at the bottom of the slide that says the name of the next speaker. If you are the next speaker, please come close to us so that you can quickly get on stage. So that's what it's going to look like. Um, we thought that Napoleon was quite well known uh, in most countries. So it's going to be a slide with a, a, a something representing Napoleon with the name of the next speaker. So here the next speaker is Yu Sasaki uh, for the PC Church report. And uh, he's already here, as you can see. Um, OK, so but uh, you cannot speak yet. I'm not done. <laughs> Um, also, you know that one of the most important tasks as a chair is to enforce a time limit because otherwise people would just talk forever. So you all gave us, well, when you send your slides, you gave us some uh, expected time that you were needed. And uh, what? The time is running short. <laughs> I don't know what to do. What, what should I do? <laughs> No. <laughs> ah, oh, okay, that's how it works. Uh, that's not working. I'm afraid we have to, to cancel the REM session. Okay, thank you. No, I will. So there is an additional rule, do not touch this remote. Um, so yeah, uh, so we, we thought that we needed some kind of implement to enforce the time limit, and to me, the most obvious way was to use a giraffe. Uh, we got inspired by this nice XKCD comic. Uh, I'll let you read it later. And. Uh, well, if you want to use a giraffe, you need to get a giraffe. So I had some reason to think that Anne had a, a giraffe. So on Monday, I asked her, Anne, do you have a giraffe? She said, yeah, I think I have one, but I'm not sure if it's still going to work for the REM session, so let me check. And later that day, I got a quite late email saying, oh, I found the giraffe, but it might really not be suitable. You might not want to use it. Uh, so, and she sent me a picture, and so if you... It's not for the faint-hearted, so if you're a bit scared, you, you should cover your eyes, because that's the picture she sent me. Uh, a giraffe that's never going to do any sort of noise again. So then, well, I didn't get, uh, well, Anne also gave me a good advice. She said, nah, maybe Maria has a giraffe. So, well, Maria, do you have a giraffe, blah, blah, blah. So now we have a giraffe, which is this one. And we also have a small version of the giraffe in, inside a bowl, which is kind of a pocket giraffe. So what's going to happen is that one minute before the time limit, we're going to do this. And then, figuratively speaking, if you go over the time, uh, we're going to throw the, the pocket giraffe. So this giraffe is called Sophie. So I'm going to drill, well, do this. So please actually go over time so that we get a chance to do this. Um, so now uh, I'll let Brice present all of the nice prizes that you can see in front of the, of the desk uh, that we're going to offer to the best presentations. Yeah, also another bit of information is that if you're um, curious about the program of the REM session, it's actually on the website. So if you go to the website, you'll see the order of speakers. That might also help people preparing their, their talks. So uh, everything uh, appearing in the REM session will appear in this prestigious journal, uh, as you can see here. And further, there will be some prizes. So there will be one prize for the best technical contribution is the Prix de l'Académie des Sciences, or the Prize of La Academy of Science. <laughs> uh, there will be the Prix Racine for the most elegant and elaborate presentation. Um, there will be the Prix, the Meta Prix, Poincaré Magritte Couperin for the best presentation that offers a prize. So you can get a prize by giving a presentation. You can also get a prize by listening to presentation and doing what they say. 
And finally, there will be the prize for the funniest and most entertaining talk, the Prix de Funès. And with that, Napoleon is calling the first speaker, uh, Yu Sasaki. Okay, so uh, I'd like to give some report about the FSC this year. So the chairs are like Florian and myself. So POSC is now a journal. So we have four submissions that run per year, and we have rebuttal, and we make a decision after two months of the submission that run. And all papers are categorized into accept, minor revision, major revision, and reject. Well, and <coughs> we are aiming to get included in Tom's ISI, I mean, having its citation index in uh, 2020. So 2020 is approaching, and the, the editor team is trying very hard to get citation index. Okay, so this is the statistics. Uh, so we, this year we received 142 submissions, and uh, some of them are resubmission after the major revision. So by excluding them, then the new number of new submissions is 122, and the number of submissions increasing as FSC approaches. So it's quite natural. So by the way, so this is the uh, statistics from last year. So last year we received 174 submissions, and this year it's 142. So like 20 percent like uh, uh, reduction, and the number of accepted papers also like reduced by 20 percent. And so this is the acceptance rate for issue by issue, and the first issue, uh, the acceptance rate is 28 percent. And the second issue is 32 percent. The third is 20 percent, and the last one is 24 percent. And the average is 20. I mean, the total is 25 percent. And by the way, so this is uh, data from the last FSC. And by comparing those two, you can see some good strategy to get your paper accepted. <laughs> so, uh, differently, you should submit the June deadline <laughs> as it's next deadline. So please submit <laughs> your paper. But actually, there is some reason why we have high acceptance rate in the issue two, and this is the number of resubmission after major revision for each issue. And for the second issue, oh, we received the highest number of resubmission after major revision. And we gave a uh, major revision only if we see some potential that the paper can, can be accepted. So basically, resubmissions after major revision has high acceptance rate. And in that's uh, is actually a trick. <laughs> and uh, uh, some more comments. Uh, so we are aiming uh, citation index, getting citation index. So when you write uh, other ISI journals like DCC, JOC, or LMCS, please cite TOCC papers, not from ePrint or personal web page. Please cite uh, TOC papers that help us to get citation index. And uh, everything published has been reviewed. So if you need more than 20 pages, and go for a long paper. I mean, even for uh, like supporting material or appendix would be reviewed. Everything is reviewed. And we also want uh, SOK paper, I mean systemization of knowledge. But the SOK paper still needs some nobility. I mean, you have to provide something which is known in the previous. So just like collecting previous uh, information is not suitable. Okay, and the start file may need some minor improvements, but please don't hack the latex file. And we are recommending using a standard B file, for example, the one maintained by ENS. Okay, I just skip that page. And uh, uh, we would like to thank program committees. So we have 45 program committees, and uh, like 18 uh, of them are uh, renewed, changed from the last year. So uh, between 30% to 40% are uh, renewed, and we are trying to keep the committees fresh, as fresh as possible. And we'd like to thank uh, General Chair Jeremy uh, for organizing this nice conference in, uh, at Paris. And we also thank invited speakers, Gregor, Maria, and Jean. And we also would like to thank our RAMP session chairs. I mean, RAMP session is just now starting. <laughs> just now started, but uh, I'm pretty sure this is going to be very fun. <laughs> and uh, Jeremy uh, tried, uh, tried hard to collect a lot of sponsorships. 
and uh, I'll be right to thank sponsors. And I heard that Jeremy is counting the page view from the TOC web page to sponsorship web page. So if you have time, then uh, please visit the TOC page and uh, like push some link. Then uh, this is gonna be help to get sponsors in the future FAC conference. And uh, we'd like to thank managing editor Gregor and the technical support Shai and Ridley here. And uh, we also thank FSC steering committees. And finally, we'd like to thank all the attendees. Okay, so by the way, uh, I direct, and now uh, I'd like to announce best paper award. So uh, we, this year, we first nominated nine candidates and um, did vote by the committees. So each committee can vote as any number of papers except for their submissions. And then the, we picked the, uh, the paper which collected the highest number of votes. And uh, the result, the uh, best paper award is given to the paper in total the partitions in this box of uh, Stierberg and uh, Kuznicek, uh, single author the paper by Leo uh, Perrin. So Leo, so can you come up to the stage? So the next talk is Hommage à Racine by Anne Canto. Next speaker, Paul Crowley. Okay, so first of all, as a chair of the steering committee of FSC, I have an important announcement. So maybe some of you know that the Caesar competition is over, so we now have a nice portfolio of authenticated encryption schemes. And you also probably know that we now have 70, uh, 57 sorry, new lightweight primitives that are our candidates to the NIST competition. And uh, we think that this is a great achievement for our community. And so within this FSC steering committee, we are considering having a special issue of task, for instance, for all these new designs and because this is important for our com community. So uh, the details now are still under discussion because it's not so easy to handle so many papers. But please, the message is first, if you are a designer, if you are interested or think that it's a good idea, your feedback is welcome. So you know all people in the steering committee, so please just give us some feedback. And the second message is that if you plan to submit as a description or something around your NIST candidates, for instance, please do not submit it to another conference or another journal. Just wait a moment and you will get some more details. Okay, so now is my second contribution, which is a cultural contribution as a chair of the French Symmetric Encryption Conference. And this contribution is related to racine, which is the French word for root. Well, more precisely, root is the English word for racine. <laughs> so Jean Racine is actually one of the most famous French writers from the 17th century, and he was a great dramatist. He wrote many tragedies. And what most people do not know is that he was also a visionary cryptographer. And he was an expert in symmetric crypto. Yes, obviously he was not a TCC guy. Uh, even if it can be argued that some TCC papers are really like tragedies, but Racine is indeed uh, probably the author of what we think is the most famous Alexandrian in the French literature, which mentions a very famous block cipher. Actually, pour qui sont ces serpents qui sifflent sur vos têtes? I don't know if Johan is around, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that he will complain and say that Serpent is probably not the best block cipher, it's even not a standard. Uh, but I'm afraid I'm not really convinced by the alternative. Pour qui sont ces reindals qui sifflent sur nos têtes? And even with 
permutation-based cryptography, it's not really convincing, like, pour qui sont ces zoudou qui siffle sur nos têtes? It doesn't sound that nice. <laughs> well, but in the following, what I would, would try to do is to, to make the importance of the, uh, of the French elegance and of Racine accessible to non-native French speakers. So I decided to continue this talk in English. And so I'll, I already explained uh, that Racine is a French word for root. And so all of this is about tragedy. Because uh, maybe you're not aware of that, but uh, roots have a very tragic destiny in our community. Uh, they are often underestimated. Since Monday, I could hear many claims like this, that the choice of the root does not matter, that we prefer to use polynomials without roots. And so I think that we really should recognize the suffering of roots in our community. Well, fortunately, uh, there is a trend to improve their situation, which is due to Grover's algorithm, which adds some roots everywhere. But to recognize this strategy, this tragedy, I would like to emphasize the importance and the diversity of roots. So indeed, there are a lot of different roots. We usually think of primitive roots, like alpha. We can also think of beta or gamma or potatoes or carrots. And uh, we don't have to forget, of course, uh, more complex roots like these ones. And at this time, at that point, I would like to really thank our general chair, Jérémy Jean, for making us aware of the existence of very complex roots, which are these Chinese artichoke that we have for lunch on Monday. So please join me to thank Jeremy for his amazing contribution to Roots. So please, Jeremy, could you come here? <laughs> so Jeremy, uh, on the behalf of ISR and of the FSC Steering Committee, I would like to give you this plaque. And so, of course, to, to thank you for your contribution. I hope you will appreciate this nice carrot color. <laughs> and I would like also to thank you for this perfect organization. So Jeremy really did an excellent job, and I think everyone here in the room enjoys a very nice banquet that we had yesterday. So thank you for your perfect organization and your hard work. And also, I would like to thank our two editors-in-chief of TASC, who serve as PC um, chairs of this conference, so Florian Mendel and Yu Sasaki, so please. You also get the, the, the plaque with the nice carrot color. <laughs> So for uh, people, for, for PC members, you know that uh, the reviewing process of TOSC is something which is really hard work because we have a, a pile of new submissions arriving every three months. And so you can think that it is even much harder for Florian and you, and they really handled all these submissions in a very nice way. So thank you, you and Florian, thank you a lot. And so finally, I would like to, to conclude my cultural contribution uh, on roots by uh, an open question. We, oh, sorry, so this, you know, and this open question is the following, to be it or not to be it? That is the question, thank you. Uh, oh, and speaker is Jan Rotella. Please welcome Paul Crowley for a thousand dollar talk. Thank you. Um, so I'm um, I'm on the Android uh, platform security uh, group, and um, tomorrow I'll be talking about how we made uh, encryption fast on 
the kinds of phones that are, are low-end phones sold in developing countries, but I'm still not happy uh, because I need to make hashing fast. Um, on an Android device, the uh, operating system is on a read-only partition, and we hash that partition with a Merkle tree, and every time we read from it, we compare to the hash. And <coughs> on uh, fast devices, that's fine. But on something like this Broadcom processor, uh, we use SHA-2, and it's just much too slow. It makes the user unhappy. We, uh, even if we switch to something faster on this kind of hardware, like Blake 2B, uh, it's still like less than 60 megasecond, uh, much slower than the underlying hardware, uh, and it makes people unhappy. Now, uh, I could try and design a super fast hashing primitive, but I think people have tried that before, and I don't have a great hope of like massively improving on the state of the art. So what I want to do is make the problem easier. So um, in a ha hash function, you know, this is one model of how to consider the security of a hash function. We say the attacker learns some key that's maybe the initialization vectors for the cipher. They choose two messages, which are different from each other, and they win uh, if those two messages collide. The attacker has enormous freedom. They can, like every last bit, they can line up, they can try every combination until they get it just right. And so these hash functions have to really do a lot of work to be sure of being secure against these kinds of attacks. And it is too slow for my purposes. Much faster are universal functions. Uh, in this model, uh, the attacker chooses two messages which are different from each other, and only then do they learn the key K. And they win if the two messages hash to the same value with this key. These are super fast. NH is 1.5 cycles per byte. Um, but I can't use this in Android. Uh, what I'll assign will have to include the key. The attacker gets the key, and once you've got the key, it's really easy to generate a, a collision with a, a, universal fun a fast universal function. Um, so this isn't gonna, going to do for my purposes. The Goldilocks position is the target collision resistant function. Uh, the attacker chooses a message, only then do they learn the key, and then they have to come up with a second message that collides using that key. Um, so I, this is great for me. We can generate this, the uh, par partition we're gonna put on the device. The last second, we choose the key, hash the partition, and we sign the key in the, and the uh, root of the partition. Uh, <coughs> and the attacker learns the key, but they have to uh, come up with the collision. Uh, they don't get to choose the first message before learning the key. Here's why I'm optimistic about this. Um, this is a, a diagram that uh, Zuko, one of the designers of uh, Blake2b, came up with. And uh, from top to bottom there, you've got a, a number of dis different uh, hash functions from MD2 to Blake2. And uh, across from left to right is time. Uh, and these hash functions turn red as uh, 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 breaks in the collision resistance are found. And so like, after about 2000, like Tiger and Whirlpool, we start to see hash functions which have stayed uh, collision resistant. Um, but it's, you know, there's, a, there's a sea of red as, as uh, hash functions get broken over time. It's clearly a hard problem. Here's the history of uh, second pre-image resistance, which is a problem I think is pretty closely related to the problem of target collision resistance. In all time, only one hash function that Zuko was able to find has ever had a second pre-image attack, and that's SNEFRU2, and the attack was found in 19, 19, 1991, not long after the uh, hash function was proposed. And so this is clearly a much easier problem. And in the past, people have done this to kind of hedge against, you know, there's been research into target collision resistance, but people have used it to kind of hedge against, you know, is this cipher secure? Let's just be on the safe side. I want to use it to cut rounds off and build super fast primitives. And so to that end, I'm offering a thousand dollar prize from my own pocket uh, just to move this forward. Um, I've got a longer presentation here with some ideas about how you might use this. You can attack my proposal, you can propose new things. You can consider quantum resistance because TCRs are useful in uh, hash-based signatures which are useful, um, which are quantum strong signatures. Um, the deadline is the end of the year. Uh, and uh, yeah, please, uh, please advance our understanding of faster than hash verification. And remember this presentation when judging the uh, prestigious uh, Poincaré Magritte Coupon Prize. Thank you so much for your time. Sorry, no time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
So next talk is Subterranean <laughs> 2.0 by Jan Rodela. Next speaker, Anton Nemenko. Yeah, you're right. It's difficult to say. I don't manage myself, so I will not say the word either. So Subterranean is um, dates back from 1992, and it was um, lately uh, used in um, for a high function or a sub uh, stream, which was a stream cipher. And by refurbishing the the cipher, we just took back uh, only the run function and make it a sponge uh, for doing a hash function where we absorb a byte every two runs and after uh, doing eight runs of the function. And we also use it as a duplex uh, thing uh, to do an authenticated encryption cipher. But this you uh, all here know about. So let's talk about the run function. So the run function is um, so, yeah, it's applying on a 257 state bit. Um, you apply a chi mapping on the all uh, states, and uh, you have uh, only one run constant, which is applied on uh, S0. And after you have theta, which takes three bits, and uh, bits, so this is written here. And after you have the pi mapping for dispers dispersion, which maps the bits at position 12 times i to position i. Uh, we don't uh, XOR the message before. We XOR in the run because we de we delete uh, some gate delay by doing so. And what we do for uh, output the key stream, we just take uh, the um, as 12 generates uh, multiplicative subgroups of 256 elements. We can just do 12 to the power of 4, and now we have uh, a multiplicative sub subgroup of the multiplicative group of size 64. So why do we do this? Is like, yeah, everyone likes multiplicative subgroups. I am sure you like multiplicative subgroups. So that's why we did this, and we output the sum of two bits, and yeah, why we do this, not because we all like multiplicative subgroups, is that because we are, we are very lazy, we also in software implementation uh, just never do the Pi um, application, and we put this, somehow this Pi in both uh, the Chi and the theta mapping. So that means we, in the, in the software implementation, you never do the Pi, and you change the offsets by, for defining chi and for defining theta, and that's it. But that's why we took the output of G of 64. Thank you. So next speaker is uh, Anton Omeko on exact MEDP MELP for heavy to round SPNs. And next speaker is Christina Bois. Um, I would like to introduce uh, this report, and uh, we define a um, heavy block cipher, uh, which um, satisfies these uh, three properties. And uh, typical example are Hazard and uh, Kuznetsk. And uh, uh, we define um, two round. Uh, differential trail and uh, two round differential uh, differential trail as omega and uh, differential as diff. And uh, our goal uh, is to calculate uh, exact MEDP uh, for uh, two round uh, heavy SPN. And uh, we can act as shown uh, on this slide, uh, but uh, we need upper bounds uh, for non-minimum weight uh, differential. Uh, we have a result for two round Kuznetsk, uh, and uh, now we design dynamic programming algorithm uh, for bounding non-minimum weight uh, differential. Uh, in uh, two-round SPN, um, uh, 
any <laughs> any actual <laughs> SPN. Uh, for example, uh, hazard, and uh, we have uh, exact uh, two round M EDP uh, on this slide, uh, and uh, we have uh, bound on on minimum weight differential. Thank you very much. So next speaker is Christina Bourra for the FSC 2020 announcement. Next speaker, Gaëtan Laurent on Saturnin. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Christina Bourra, and I'm here to present uh, you uh, so FSC of next year. So I'm sure you're all enjoying um, so this year FSC that is very well organized by Jeremy. And so the question is, uh, where is going to happen, of course, FSC of next year? So you have a small uh, hint on this picture. So FSC of this next year will be in Athens. So Athens is the capital of Greece. Um, the dates are um, almost as this year. So it will be in the end of March, so 22 to 26. And uh, why in Greece? Actually, well, uh, uh, this is a very natural place to have FSE because uh, Greeks, especially guys from Sparta, they already know about symmetric cryptography and they used it like centuries before AS was, um, uh, was designed. Okay, so some practical information. So the program chairs, uh, as you probably know, it's um, in Yu Sasaki and uh, the new uh, co-chair is Gaëtan Laurent. So I will serve as general chair. And uh, the conference uh, will be um, uh, like three days and a half exactly as this year. So we will end at Thursday um, on uh, just before noon. Uh, there is already a website you can visit with some uh, pre uh, preliminary uh, information. And uh, so uh, it will be in Athens, but we're in Athens. So this will be happen uh, in a five-star hotel that is called Royal Olympic Hotel. Uh, this hotel is very well um, situated. It's just in the historical center of Athens. Uh, you can get there uh, from the national, uh, from the international airport by a direct metro or bus line. Um, it is very close, uh, for example, to, um, to the Acropolis. If you want to visit the Acropolis, it's only uh, 14 minutes if you want to walk. Um, and the negotiated price, if you decide to stay there, it's um, 130 euros for um, single and double rooms with breakfast. Uh, so if this is a lot, uh, then no problem. There are many other hotels nearby that for, for all possible budgets. Okay, so these are some photos from the hotel. So this is the room. The main advantage of the conference room is that uh, alcohol is permitted inside for the run session. Um, but of course, the room is not the most important. It's, uh, the most important is where we're going to have lunches. So all lunches will be served at the rooftop restaurant. Um, that has this, this view to the Acropolis, or this one, if you are seated from the other side. And uh, this is even if the weather is bad, so no worries about this. And if the weather is good, there is also a swimming pool that uh, can be open for us if, yes, if the conditions permit it. Okay, so if you want to come to FSC, you have to probably want, to, if you want your paper to be presented at FSC 2020, then you still have three deadlines. Um, the deadlines are like this year, so 1st June, 1st of September, and 23 of November. Um, the tentative fees, it's um, a little bit like this year, so, uh, well, it has to be adjust adjusted, but it will be around uh, 530 US dollars. Uh, for regular, um, yeah, for um, uh, regular fee, and uh, st for students it will be like half a price as usual. Okay, so that's all. Uh, so I hope to see you all in Athens. And if you have any questions, or most importantly, if you want uh, to be a sponsor for FSC next year, um, you can send an email to to this address. Thank you very much. So next speaker is Gaëtan Laurent on Saturnin, and the following speaker is Stefan Kolber on the Webox contest. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Saturnin, which is our uh, submission to the NIST competition, and uh, hopefully will be published somewhere, maybe in Tusk, so that we can go to Athens. That would be nice. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, so the NIST is running this competition, and they have two main uh, requirements, right? It should be well-studied algorithm, and it should be lightweight. So, of course, what, do, what did we do? Well, we're designing a new block cipher, obviously, and we're going to have a, a 256-bit key on state. So, uh, why are we doing this? Uh, well, it's because we care about post-quantum security, 
because if you look at our team, we have Maria in the team, so of course it has to be post-quantum secure. And uh, we, we want this in a strong sense, so we want to resist attacks uh, against a superposition query with the adversary, so in this uh, Q2 model. And this means we have to be a little bit careful, and we need a large state, and we need to be careful with the modes of operations. And of course, because we have a, a new block cipher, we also need to be careful about its security. So we're going to do something that looks very much like the AES, because the AES, of course, is the best cipher ever. So uh, if we have something that looks like the AES, it will be like the second best. So hopefully, that will be good enough. Uh, so of course, the, m the main question, why is it called Saturna? Uh, well, the, the, so we want a lightweight cipher. So uh, what is the standard of lightweightness? Obviously, it's the duck. I mean. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen Monty Python on the Holy Grail, and we know that if you want to know if something is lightweight, you have to compare it to a duck. So we need a duck name, and uh, there's a, a famous French duck. It looks like this, and it's called Saturna. So yeah, our submission will be called Saturna. Now, uh, how do we design our cipher? Uh, well, we had a, a bit of a hint. Uh, according to Kepler in um, Mysterium Cos Cosmograticum, uh, the planet Saturn is associated to the cube. So of course, our cipher will be a cube. So the state looks like this, uh, so a cube, and we're going to do a bit slice operations, so we have nice components like this. If you look at the S M MDS matrix, maybe you recognize it from one of the talks uh, yesterday uh, about lightweight MDS matrices. So those are all very good components, and when we combine them, we have this very nice picture. I'm sure you can understand very easily what's happening. Uh, the nice thing is we have MDS matrices, so you can have bounds on the number of active S boxes for one round. And then uh, if, you want, if you look at two rounds, we have super boxes. So we have five to the square active boxes. And then if you look at eight rounds, we have meta boxes with even more active boxes. So everything is very nice. Uh, of course, this picture is a little bit hard to read because it's a 2D picture, but we have a 3D cipher. So uh, that's uh, not optimal. So I also have a 3D picture. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it very well. <laughs> maybe when the slides will be online, it will be easier. But yeah, this is maybe the first time we have a 3D picture in the slides of a RAMP session conference. So thank you. <laughs> so next is uh, Stefan Kolbal on the Webox contest, edition two. And the following speaker is Thomas Achour on efficiency metric. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, thank you. I would like to bring your attention to another competition, which is the Webox contest. So this is the official Capture the Flag for Chess 2019. So if you're not familiar with the previous edition, the goal is here you can be both designer of challenges, but also break challenges. You can upload C implementation of AES 128, which embed the key. So you should maybe not put it just in, in the plane. And other people can then break these challenges. And the longer your challenge survives, the more points you get. So this already started uh, last Friday, so you can join from now. So if you have any ideas, feel free to submit immediately. And the competition will end shortly before chess, and whoever gets the most points up to this point will win. But for those of you who know about the previous contest, we added a few new rules and changed the scoring a little bit to make it more exciting. So you, this time you will also get bonus points for inverting some ciphertext. So for every challenge submitted, you can request through an API some ciphertext, and if you manage to invert them, you will get points. And also we will score this time if you provide more efficient white box implementations. So if you need less code size, if you can compute faster, you will get a higher score more quickly. So there are already quite a few people registered. So this is a bit outdated. So the here it says there's this one competition, uh, one challenge which is still open, but it got broken last night, I think. <laughs> so too late for you, but I'm sure there's going to be more challenges coming in, in the next days. Yeah, you can find all the information on the contest on this website. There will also be a workshop co-located with Eurocrypt about the uh, white box in general. So if you're attending Eurocrypt, this might also be interesting for you. Otherwise, I hope a lot of people will participate, and thank you. So please, all speakers, uh, I'd like to remind you to advance the slide to the next one so that we get the chance to see the Napoleon picture.
Thank you. So this is now Thomas Schur on Efficient Symmetric Primitive for Advanced Cryptographic Protocols, a marvelous contribution. And next speaker is Lorenzo Grassi on Hades Design. Okay, so I don't have much time. I'll need to be super efficient given the amount of information I want to put in my presentation. I'm Thomas Schur from COSIC. Uh, if you don't know me, I don't care. Um, <laughs> my, um, I'm presenting uh, what we call Efficient Symmetric Primitives for Advanced Cryptographic Protocols or just a marvelous contribution. And the background for this is that um, the Ethereum Foundation, the um, organization behind the Ethereum um, cryptocurrency, is considering adding a zero knowledge mechanism into their uh, engine. And uh, this company, Starkware, it's a startup in Israel, contacted us in COSIC to help them uh, build a hash function efficient for um, their product. They're um, promoting zero knowledge Starks. Um, and, uh, well, after a few months of uh, work, we came up with um, the hash function Jarvis. So the, um, the idea behind Jarvis is that, um, well, we start from the AES, the best cipher um, ever invented, um, <laughs> which is already quite efficient for Starks, but it um, has a state of 16 uh, bytes which means that every operation you perform, you need to perform 16 times. Instead, you can work with a large uh, state element um, and, um, and a fine polynomial after that. And then just the, the AES just uh, immediately becomes Jarvis because you don't need the shift rows and mixed columns anymore. Um, but, and, well, so we put that online and a few, month, few weeks later, some of our colleagues uh, published uh, an attack uh, against this uh, algorithm, so Jarvis was hit. Um, now, just to say that we actually have some uh, different, we, we don't agree, uh, we don't necessarily agree with this attack, we have some reservations, like every other designer ever. Um, Marcus will present their attack later today, I, I'm sure he will be super um, honest about, about it, I'm no kidding here, and we're actually talking about the, um, where we disagree. But, when we found out about uh, this attack, we uh, were already in the middle of developing something even better than Jarvis, and you're the first ones to see that. Vision. Vision um, is similar to Jarvis, only that the state is now composed of M uh, state elements. Um, M is expected to be a small number, like two or three. Um, and then you can adjust the size of each element and similar to AES, um, we, don't, we defend against differential and linear attacks. And then you compose an affine layer, which is an affine linearized sparse polynomial that is efficient to compute in zero knowledge. And this is a round. Um, it's composed of two steps. So in the first step, we use the inverse of that polynomial. And in the second step, we use directly that polynomial. Uh, and we mix uh, the elements using an MDS matrix. Um, yeah, so that gives a high algebraic degree. And that's very stark friendly. Um, vision works for uh, binary fields. Um, one thing we noticed for Jarvis when he published that is that although we stressed everywhere that it only works for binary fields and it's, we don't claim any security for prime fields, people were sending us emails asking, but how do you use it for prime fields? So instead of just uh, publishing something that they'll be misusing, we decided to also design another uh, cipher in a um, prime field flavor, that's rescue. Now there are no good affine linearized sparse polynomials, so instead um, we use a power mapping for the nonlinear part, and we um, alternate between using the power map directly and the inverse of that power map. Um, the MDS part works uh, the same. Um, and um, those two designs, in addition to being wonderful, secure, and great, also lend themselves pretty well to uh, sponge constructions because you can have, let's say, two elements. You designate one as the rate, the other as the capacity, or you can have three state elements and then two um, rate parts and one capacity part or the other way around. Um, and that's the team. Um, Simon de Hoche, Abdel Rahman Ali, Eli Ben Sasson and Alan Shapianyats. Thank you.
So next speaker is uh, Lorenzo Grassi on Hades Design Strategy for MPC Snark Starks Picnic. And the following speaker is a merge of two speakers, Letov Bayran on Sparkle. Okay, so thanks. So they, I would like to give a brief presentation about a competitor of the design proposed by Thomas. And application of this uh, uh, design are many, for example, security, secure multi-party computation, zero knowledge, uh, signal to scheme, and so on, that requires primitive from symmetric crypto and where the performance of this application depends on the performance of this symmetric crypto. In particular, the major cost is due to do no linear operation. So what we try to do is to try to reduce the number of no linear operation. A possible way to do this is to move from SPN to partial SPN, but I mean, it's not very nice because um, some uh, strategy, for example, the white race strategy doesn't work for uh, partial SPN cipher. So you have to think about new, uh, new strategies and in general, they, they are very complicated. So we are quite lazy, so what we did is just to mix SPN and partial SPN, and we obtained the other strategy, where some round of full S-box layer, the middle round is just one S-box per round, and then we have again a uh, round with full S-box layer. So in this way, we can, for example, reuse again the white tray strategy. So for example, this is Addis Minsky. Uh, we have just round with uh, full S-box layer, big MDS matrix, uh, and then again round with partial S-box layer, and round again with full S-box layer. And this cipher can be implemented both in FP and in F2 to the N. So I'm not an expert, but many people in this group work on applications, so just let me give some result about uh, practical application. For example, what about the signature? Well, uh, using this design, we can obtain results that are better than low MC, which is submitted at NIST. For example, we can have a, sm a smaller signature size, 700 bit versus 1000, and it's much, much faster. So factor 10. For MPC, the, better, the, the best schemes for this application are NIMC and Regen PRF, and uh, we can have similar results using this strategy, and we also work on Stark and Stack application. So for example, we can uh, improve the result uh, that were obtained using the Pedersen hash using Snark, and for Stark, well, the competitor, we have now a competitor, uh, what about ja uh, Jarvis and Friday? This design is a little uh, less competitive, but it seems that they are broken. Thanks. So now are the Sparkle permutations by Letov Beiran, and the next speaker is Stefan Kölbel again on the third skinny. Thank you. So our quantum uh, superposition collapsed, so it's either me or Christoph, and it turns out to be me. I'm going to talk about briefly our uh, NIST submission, which is called Sparkle. So the city of Paris was kind enough to stage a bit of uh, advertisement for us yesterday. When you arrive by boat close to the Eiffel Tower, it sparkled to advertise our algorithm, which was pretty kind of the city. So Sparkle is a family of, spa of Sparks-like permutations, hence their name. So we have an Arx box. Think of it like... Uh, an AES Super S box that operates on 64 bits using ARCs operations. And we have a linear layer, which is built like a Feistel network, uh, just like in Sparks. And this gives us a nice SPN structure. So although it's ARCs based, it's also much easier to study than other ARCs based uh, algorithms. Much like in ASCON, we have two versions, a slim one, which we use during absorptions, and a big one, which we use just before squeezing. Our goal, Although this is the French Symmetric Encryption Conference, uh, I think for historical reasons, uh, this used to be referred to as the Fast Software Encryption Conference, so we thought it was relevant to introduce it here. Uh, with this uh, Sparkle permutations, we build two families of algorithms, uh, hash functions called ESH, it's a city in Luxembourg with a nice coat of arm, and we use uh, them to build the SHVEM, authenticated encryption algorithms, uh, using the Beetle mode. There, are, there is more information uh, on this web page, and we also have a mailing list, and I'm also very curious to see what happens if we spend too long on stage, so I'm going to wait for a bit. 20 seconds, that's going to be a hard one. Questions, questions. do you have any yeah, questions? Any questions for... for, for can, can you read the outline letters of the website? Yeah, that's not a very good question, so I'd rather have another one. Uh, that you are going to have uh, to ask Mridul. We are not security-proof people. I can tell you about the design process, but unfortunately... Okay. okay, I'm sorry. You'll have to take the question online, please. 
So next talk is uh, Stefan Kolbo on the third Kinecrypt analysis competition, and the following speaker is going to be Markus Schofnegger on algebraic dots. So yeah, well, previously announced the competition starting. Now I'm announcing a competition ending, which is the third Skinny Crypt Analysis competition. So I think you already heard a lot about Skinny. There were a lot of uh, papers dealing with it. And it's a lightweight tweakable block cipher. Received quite a lot of uh, crypto analysis. And we also had a Skinny competition, I think, since three years. Every year at FSE, we announced the competition and ended the competition and extended the competition. And if you're interested in the previous competition, just go to the website. There's a lot of information on that. But for the third competition, we wanted to do something a little bit different. So before, it was always like, OK, if you break that many rounds, you will get one present. If you break that many rounds, you get two presents. If you break a lot of rounds, you get five presents. This time, we wanted to do something a bit more practical. So we provided a set of, of plain text ciphertexts which you could download on the Skinny website. And your goal was to extract the key from this. So it was in both cases, we had a Skinny 64 and Skinny 128 with 128 bit key. And you should send us the key. <coughs> so this is the timeline of the competition. And basically, everything happened in last April from the submission point of view. But a lot of people also worked after afterwards. So on 4th of April, at 12 o'clock, exactly 12 o'clock, so Virginie broke the five rounds version of Skinny 64. But then I think just a few hours later, maybe she noticed that she missed breaking the four rounds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, maybe she can comment on it. <laughs> and very quickly after, just one day, we got another contender who started working on the Skinny 128, and then it kind of started a little race. So catching up on the five rounds, OK, we do six rounds. OK, then I also do six rounds. Seven rounds, seven rounds for 128. But then, finally, the skinny 128 got a bit ahead. Maybe, I don't know, if it was around the Easter, and, you, and the other skinny 64 people were on, on holiday. And we continue. And you can see the time span gets a bit longer. but. For Skinny 128, nothing happened anymore. And the best result we got was then 12 rounds for Skinny 64 at the end of April. So we would like to announce now who are the uh, winners of this, which are Patrick Dabé and uh, Virginie Lalemant, who broke the Skinny 64 uh, challenge for 12 rounds. So I would like to join them for getting their prize and all give them applause. <laughs> So I hope we go over time also. <laughs> no Dorian, no Dorian, no Dorian, Dorian this time. Just yeah, just for explanation, for those who are not familiar with our procedure, we always, so we are offers on Skinny from five different uh, countries, and we always bring prizes from everywhere. So we have prizes from Japan, prizes from Singapore, prizes from Denmark, France, Germany. So a lot of nice things for you to enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you still have to stay, but it's a bit of a spoiler, but you have to stay. <laughs> 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 and for Skinny 128, uh, Alexei Udovenko is the winner. He broke 10 rounds of Skinny 128. Unfortunately, he's not here today because he's preparing for his PhD defense. But nonetheless, we would like to thank him for his uh, participation and his nice results. <laughs> also, if you're interested in for both these competitions, the both authors provided us a short report explaining, and it's quite interesting. And we also had the competition for the most interesting cryptanalysis. So, we would also like to award the most interesting cryptanalysis to Patrick, no, Patrick Dabé <laughs> and Virginie Lallemant, who provided, from our point of view, the most interesting cryptanalysis. So the interesting thing was with the challenge we gave, there was some bias in the plain text, which was quite interesting to see if this makes a difference for the text and how you can exploit it. 
And they showed a very nice uh, truncated differential attack. Also, it needed quite a lot of operations. So maybe it's not only Bitcoin wasting a lot of computations. Also, the skinny computation quite used some electricity for your university, I guess. So please thank them again for their nice results. <laughs> And we would like to thank all the participants, also the people who tried to break things and didn't succeed. <laughs> and if you want, you can still submit results and we will put them on the website. Thank you. Thank you, even though you were a bit over time. So next talk is Algebraic Crypt Analysis of Jarvis and Friday by Marcus Schofnegger. And the next speaker is Gaëtan Laurent again on the shack seat. Thanks. So it seems I have three minutes to convince you all that this attack does indeed work. Four. Oh, I have four minutes, so it's even better. So it's joint work, basically. First about the design. So Jarvis is a block cipher. Friday is a hash function using this block cipher. Uh, both primitives were proposed by Tomer and Seaman um, in recently, so last year. Their goal is efficiency in the stack setting, and some security, aborts, some security arguments are brought from the best cipher out there, again. So the structure is very similar to another cipher, which is MIMSI, which you can see on the left side. And the right side shows the Jarvis round function. So basically, we have the inversion S box and then two affine polynomials of degree four. And also similar to the AES 10 to 14 rounds. The attack idea is very uh, simple. Um, we exploit two facts. First, uh, the both polynomials have a very low degree. So this is good for the Grebner basis. And uh, the second fact is that for all non-zero x, we can basically say that if y equals to the inverse of x, then y times x equals to 1, which is a degree 2 function. And the procedure is then to describe a round from both sides, and basically we connect both parts at the S-box. Then we compute the Grebner basis, and we try to solve for the unknown variables, which include the keys. So the resulting equation system then includes intermediate variables for every second round. Um, so this is after another optimization we've done. And uh, we also exploit the fact that every round key is a linear function of the master key, so we only need one variable for the keys. Um, and the resulting system has then our half equations of degree 32 in our half variables, and to be secure against this kind of attack. So these are just preliminary results, and the full results, plus a practical verification, will hopefully be published uh, soon. Yeah. Thanks. And so the final and last talk of this rep session is the Shack Seed by Gaëtan Laurent. Next speaker, no one. Thank you. So this is a joint work with uh, Thomas Perrin. And just before I begin, I would like to uh, make some comments about a previous talk about hash functions. I'd like to point out that MD2, MD4, and MD5 are broken by pre-image attack. Just. Uh, so, uh, the point of this talk is about uh, SHA-1, and uh, yeah, basically we've been trying to get rid of SHA-1 for a while now. Uh, yeah, really, we, we, want, we want it to get out, right? So in terms of uh, cryptanalysis, it's been broken uh, since 2005. There was the first theoretical attack, it's been improved, then it was implemented in practice quite recently. Uh, and yeah, basically cryptographers have spoken, broken means broken, SHA-1 must go, right? So uh, there's been several attempts at uh, withdrawal agreements to get rid of SHA-1. So the first one was in uh, 2006, and this said basically uh, we must switch to SHA-2 before 2010. Yeah, that didn't really work. Uh, next attempt was in 2011, and uh, people from uh, CAs and browsers, they said, uh, well, SHA-2-56 is, uh, SHA is not widely implemented enough, so we can still use SHA-1, but really we, we should think about moving out, so yeah, still not very strong statement. Uh, in 2014, we had a real, uh, a real plan, and the idea was that in 2017, Shawan should go away from uh, certificates. Uh, they considered moving the deadline earlier, but that didn't happen, and then finally in 2017, uh, beginning of the year, now all uh, modern browsers actually reject Shawan certificates. So good, right? That's done. Uh, well, actually, no. If you look uh, at what's happening today, well, SHA-1 certificates still exist. You can still buy them, actually. Some CAs will happily sell you a SHA-1 certificate, and uh, they're used in several contexts. And interestingly, uh, even though browsers now reject them, if you 
go to other software, like a mail client, like the, the mail application in Windows 10, it's perfectly fine with a SHA-1 certificate, and uh, some servers are still using them, like this uh, server from one of the departments in the computer science of uh, to Darmstadt, yeah, they, they have a SHA-1 certificate, and it's still valid, and if you connect with a mail client from Windows 10, you get no warning, and everything goes fine. So yeah, there are still some SHA-1 certificates around. And uh, it's not just certificates. If you look uh, in TLS, for instance, in the handshake of TLS, you need a hash function. And SHA-1 is still quite widely used there, about 5% of the website, and I have some nice examples. Uh, Springer uses SHA-1. Uh, oh, there should have been a second one. Um, yeah, it's here. Uh, Parliament.uk also uses uh, SHA-1. For Nice example. So uh, yeah, so we need to negotiate new standards, but it turns out it's quite complicated when you try to get rid of something that uh, used to be there for a long time, and yeah, you have uh, legacy issues, you need a transition period, you need to make up a plan, you need to negotiate, you extend the deadline, yeah, yeah. So yeah, nobody knew this would be so complicated, right? Uh, so I suggest maybe we should get some help from people who are experts in uh, getting rid of stuff. So like, this is a nice, uh, uh, timetable, I think we should make a similar plan, like uh, yeah, several phases, several options, and so on. It's, it's all very simple. I'm sure we can get rid of SHA-1 with a, a plan like this. Uh, I mean, yeah, just, just go to the exit, right? It's, it's, it's easy. Um, and yeah, ju just keep moving, and uh, yeah, you will go forward, right? It's you're not <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so we came up with a, a different plan. And uh, basically, it seems that users don't care much about collision attacks. I mean, yeah. We have, collision, we have had collision attacks on SHA-1 for 15 years, and it's still there. So let's try to do something else. Uh, let's try to do chosen prefix collisions. And uh, in practice, chosen prefix collisions are uh, much more important. You can break a lot more stuff in practice. You can break certificates. You can break the handshake in TLS. And so the idea is to follow the MD5 model that was uh, applied uh, a few years ago. And there was some uh, really nice work by uh, Mark Stevens and others uh, doing uh, a chosen prefix collision on MD5, and this really helped kick MD5 out. So the plan is to do the same with SHA-1, and so we have uh, the first step in this direction. We have a nice paper that will be presented at Eurocrypt, and we have an attack with complexity uh, between 2 to the 67 and 69, and so we estimate it will be something like 67.3, and the previous best result was 2 to the 77, so that's a nice improvement. So, uh, of course, we need some last-minute negotiation before the, the actual exit. So, uh, there's something good that came out of the cryptocurrency bubble. Uh, there are actually lots of cheap GPUs that you can rent now, because, yeah, they're not using them anymore, right? It's not, <laughs> not worth it. So, uh, you, can actually, you could actually run this computation, this to, to the 67-something. Uh, it will cost you about 500,000 euros, so that's about the price of a one-bedroom apartment in Paris. So it's not, not that much, right? Or uh, maybe something more familiar to you, it's about the price of uh, four uh, grants for PhD students. So, yeah, you can choose four students or one SHA-1 chosen prefix collision. Uh, so that's the current state. We're trying to look forward to the future relationship with SHA-1, so we have some few extra ideas, and we think we can bring it down a little bit, and it should be below the cost of a single PhD student, and hopefully we, we are trying to implement this uh, uh, soon, well, as soon as we can. Thank you. So, sorry, no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but PhD students don't come, they don't need homes. Uh, thank you, Gaidon, uh, and thanks all of the speakers of the session again. <laughs> so please don't go, because now we have the Ceremonie des Prix. We just need a few minutes together with Brice to decide who gets what. Uh, hopefully it won't take more than an hour, and uh, especially if you give a talk, please stick around, and uh, you can come and look at all of those marvelous prices that some of you will get. Thanks.
Okay, so we are now ready to offer the prizes. So we will describe what those are. So we'll start, uh, which one? Okay, in order. Okay, so this prize is uh, for the Le Prix de l'Académie des Sciences, uh, 700, 700 grams of uh, fine uh, Beaufort des Alpages, uh, from, uh, so it's uh, cheese. Uh, and uh, this prize is awarded to, let me check. Um, Brice will announce the winners. <laughs> Thank you. This prize is awarded to Gaëtan uh, for the first, not for the second presentation. And uh, also, um, you will note that this cheese is, is gradually prepared to wrap it so that it will be transformed by the and it's going to stay in Paris. <laughs> Which is quite unfortunate, really. <laughs> E even though I have to disagree with the fact that collisions don't matter if they're not chosen prefix. I also think they matter. But some, <laughs> Thank some you. Some people don't agree, apparently. <laughs> yeah, he keeps the price. Uh, maybe I, I get a small bite. I don't know. Um, next prize. Le prix Racine. Le prix Racine uh, for the most elegant presentation, uh, which is this uh, box of uh, macarons. Uh, is awarded to for uh, homage to Racine. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, so the meta prix. Uh, so, how many of you actually got the joke of uh, Point Carré Magritte Couperin? Don't be ashamed. One, Roberto. Okay. Ah, well, that's good enough. Uh, so, for this prize, we have award this, um, this recording of uh, some chosen pièces de clavecin by François Couperin. So, François Couperin is a French composer born in 1668, uh, di well, died in 1733. Uh, so, I will read uh, the, the, the different pieces that you can have. Uh, so, first, the troisième prélude from L'art de toucher le clavecin. Then, from the second livre de pièces de clavecin, La Ménétou, Les Petits Âges, La Basque, La Chazée, Les Amusements. Uh, from L'Art de Toucher le Clavecin, Le Septième Prélude. From the second livre de pièces de clavecin, again, Les Moissonneurs, Les Langueurs Tendres, Le Gazouillement, La Bersant, <laughs> Les Barricades Mystérieuses, Les Bergeries, La Commère, Le Moucheron. And from the premier livre de pièces de clavecin, La Ténébreuse Allemande, La Première Courante, La Seconde Courante, La Lugubre Sarabande, La Gavotte, La Favorite Chaconne à Deux Temps. All of those are played by Aurélien Delage. And this prize is awarded to... Paul Crowley. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> so the last prize is uh, Le Prix de Funès, or the prize of Funès, for, uh, well, to be honest, we had a hard time awarding it. Maybe we thought we should drink the bottle ourselves, but that wouldn't be very nice. So this is a bottle of a fine Croze Hermitage, uh, wine from the Rhone Valley. And this prize is awarded to... <laughs> for being the first to try to see what would happen if we went over time. <laughs> hmm? Not really. Uh, congratulations. So that's it for the RAM session. We hope you enjoyed it uh, and uh, see you tomorrow for the last day of the conference.